The Connecticut Music Oral History Podcast is a deep dive interview series with musicians, artists, conduits, collectors, and dedicated fans, focusing on 20th century Connecticut music history. This project preserves narratives, heralds unsung movers and shakers, and defines Connecticut's influential role in cultural history. I'm your host, Brendan Toller. I'm an artist, a musician, a filmmaker, and marketing manager of the incredible Verso Studios at the Westport Library, where this very podcast is being produced. Verso Studios is a media resource and production hub, serving as an inclusive, empowered, future-forward cultural and learning center. A library branch of the 21st century, Verso Studios provides programming, commercial services, as well as educational and content creation opportunities. We have a state-of-the-art hybrid analog recording studio designed in part by Rob Fraboni, the same guy who built Keith Richards' home studio down the road. We record bands, artists, audiobooks, podcasts, and everything in between. We have video production suites, classes, and events. Check us out at the Verso Studios website and on social media. Welcome back, everyone. The podcast was on a bit of a sabbatical, but we have a lot in store in coming months. This month of June 2022 brings us Beehive Queen Christine Ullman. Christine is, of course, Connecticut music aristocracy. In her time with blues garage band The Wrong Black Bag, Fancy, The Scratch Band, and eventually the Saturday Night Live Band, Christine is a regional and global tour de force. Here's our conversation on Connecticut roots, collecting, the music visit large, and so much more. But first, here's a track from Christine and Rebel Montez called The Deep End, featuring Andy York, former Connecticut music oral history guest Big Al Anderson, and Connecticut slash Mata Hoople legend Ian Hunter. Down in the deep end. 
let's go down to the deep end. Christine, what was your first musical memory? Wow. See, I didn't think you were going to ask me that right off the bat, Brendan. That's well, you can think about it. I, no, I'll think. I, I'll th- All right. So, um, well, Dick Clark had a show that was sponsored by Beech Nut Gum, and I wasn't really that big of a fan of American Bandstand at all. But he had a show, I think it was on Saturday night, and I was little, but I remember Della Reese was on. She had a she had a hit called Don't You Know. And so in other words, this was like a variety show. There were no kids dancing or anything. And and then at one point he had Jackie Wilson on and I made my father go out and buy me forty fives of Jackie Wilson. And my fa- and my father did it, you know. And that really was sort of the beginning of my my little girl record collection. So I think that's my first musical memory. And did you always grow up in Connecticut, or was it? Born in the Bronx. My mother's parents were from the Bronx. She and her sister had gone to St. Patrick's Cathedral High School on scholarship. And my grandparents were working people. So we moved to Connecticut almost right away. And, but we spent a lot of time in the Bronx. So a lot of my orientation was toward the New York radio stations, which of course we could get in Connecticut. So you could get the AM stations just fine. But grew up, uh, first moved to Meriden and then settled in Cheshire. And Cheshire's where we grew up. Um, Suburb of New Haven. And siblings? I have a brother and two sisters. I'm the oldest. Ah, okay. So you were the maybe the access point of all this music. Yeah. Then. Yeah, my brother uh, owns a recording studio, my brother Vic in West Haven now, and uh, he and I just were the ones that really went on in, in music. So, Were your parents musical? Yes. My father played piano by ear. There was always piano playing going on in the basement, family room. My mother was an amateur dancer, so she could dance... Uh, tap and so forth and there were always 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 records playing in our house a lot of music all the time what were some of their favorites frank sinatra sinatra perry como ella fitzgerald Uh, my mother had gone to cafe society as a girl as as a young lady in new york she'd gone to cafe society she'd seen billy holiday the other performers that used to perform cafe society was a nightclub in new york so yeah, so we had that kind of cosmopolitan side to it, to our growing up in that we were, we'd spend weeks uh, on end in, in New York in the summer. So have a lot of great memories of uh, the, the radio in the kitchen in my grandparents' apartment. When they died, it was, the, I got it. I said, I want the radio and it's in my living room now. So it was a big radio then? No, it's, well, it's a box radio. It's gray, gray plastic, you know. No, no, not not a console radio. Gotcha. It was a radio that sat on a little stool or something in their kitchen. But that was where I used to listen to Murray the K and you know things like that. So it was very important to me. And your parents didn't thumb their noses at rock and roll. They what, baby? They, they didn't thumb their noses at oh, rock no, and no. roll. Our, our, uh, we were the ones. Uh, we were where every, we rehearsed in our house. Kept all the amps there. My father in the beginning drove us around. No, they embraced it. Um, when um, when we started playing gigs, my father at first drove us around. Then we found our crazy friend Dave Robb to drive us around in a hearse. You know, I mean, but no, they were really, really, really supportive all the time. Um, well, when does that start, the singing and the playing? Um, Vic was 15 and I was 16. Vic had a band called The Trippers that was like a, almost like a Beach Boys knockoff kind of thing. And then... Then they got a guy that played B3, and they decided they wanted a singer, so he asked me. And that was when I started, you know, singing with them. And then we changed the name of the band to The Wrong Black Bag. Wrong had an H on the end of it. We thought that was so cool. I'm sure it was misspelled everywhere. Um, just just adding the H because it was cool. No, it was cool. no, like, signifying. Of yeah, anything. no, just, I think we, we just thought, oh, we'll just, we'll just screw with everybody. We'll have an H on the end of it. 
And then, you know, then we ended up with a single. We had a single on mainstream records and uh, when we were very young. Talk about that. Uh, a neighbor of ours was also from New York. And through some different people, she knew about this guy, Bob Shad. So Bob Shad is an incredibly interesting cat in the music business. He had been down south, recorded Ray Charles when he was still Ray Charles Robinson, recorded him, uh, did field recordings of Ray Charles. He also then started a label called Mainstream where his big acts were Big Brother and the Holding Company, The Ultimate Spinach with Jeff Skunk Baxter, and The M Boy Dukes with uh, Ted Nugent. And we came on as like the baby band the baby band. So she drove us to New York. She she knew people that knew Bob Shad. So the next thing you know, we go to we go to New York and we audition for Bob Shad. And he he loves us, but the reason that he loved us, we found out later, was that he was losing Janis Joplin to Columbia and they were about to jump to Columbia and he wanted a band with a female singer to take her place. So there we were, little babies and uh and we record a version of Wake Me, Shake Me by the Blues Project, which later on I found out was a staple singer's song. I didn't know that then, but of course I know it now. And uh, it comes out on mainstream records. And, we, and they buy us onto the charts. We were like, we were under like 80 on the Billboard, which was to, a total payola thing right from the get-go. But uh, that's our entree into, into show, uh, for the real world of show business was Bob Shad. Also, he, Vic and I would go to his office where there, were, there was vinyl all over the floor. He had vinyl albums here, and he gave us, uh, he gave me a Ruth Brown, he gave me a Laverne Baker, original on Atlantic, and original Little Richard. I have these to this day. The vinyl was so heavy that you could probably kill somebody with it if you hit them over the head. It certainly wouldn't have broken, probably would have broken their head. But he would just, you'll probably like this, you'll like this, you'll like this. And of course, I'm like, I like it all, you know. I'll take everything that's on this floor, you know. Bob Shad. Wow, so Ray Charles, Janis Joplin, he was kind of like yeah. a conduit in a way. Yes, but he, but he had, ha- he had already before he formed mainstream, he had already had this whole jazz thing, of which, as much as I can figure, the most prominent to me was that in Florida he had gone out and recorded and recorded Ray Charles. You know, very, very young Ray Charles. At, when Ray Charles started, he wanted to be um, uh, Nat King Cole, and he really sounded. He he tried to sound like Nat King Cole. So it's not the Ray Charles we know, but uh, it was a very different sound, much smoother. Um, often when you are, even just starting out as a band, but even when you're starting out as a performer, artist, you kind of need like uh, models. Mm-hmm. Who, are, who are yours? Uh, Dusty Springfield was maybe number one. Um, you know, I love the girl groups. Um, big big Ronettes fan um but Dusty just she spoke to me in so many ways I honestly wasn't a big Janis Joplin fan I thought she she screamed a lot I thought but she certainly wore her heart on her sleeve but Dusty Springfield was such an accomplished singer and so really elegant I thought at the same time that she was so gritty so she appealed to me Aretha Franklin right off the bat as well um but, mo- you know, I also was a huge fan of anything R&B. So, so again, Jackie Wilson, people like that. I, I, I loved a lot of male singers uh, were, 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 were some of my real favorites. And um, I always gravitated towards black singers. That just was the way it was. Dusty was kind of the exception. You know? Could you find those records in Connecticut? or you Yeah. Had to- oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I started collecting, um, you know, pretty early on. And... Um, also, you know, between the Beatles and the Stones, my, my, my far and away favorite was the Stones, although, you know, don't kill me, because the Beatles are fabulous, you know, but I dug what the Stones were doing, how they were... Um, elevating blues. Elevating, music. yeah. But we really came to the blues through the Butterfield Blues Band and the Blues Project. Those were the two bands that really opened the, the door for me about blues, and then I began searching backward to the songs that Butterfield was covering and that the Blues Project was covering. Blues Project was Al Cooper's group in the beginning and Danny Kalb. And, um, and so that's how I began building my knowledge of, of blues, of Delta blues mm-hmm. and Chicago blues. 
and you guys were a gigging band. So oh, what, yeah. what were the... What, I read on your bio there was a there was a coffee house circuit. Yeah, so you could talk about yeah. that a bit. But then I want to know like, did you guys play Bill Miller's Castle? Yes, or, oh, yes. Okay. Oh, of course, we got to hear about all that. So. Oh, of course we played. There was quite a teen club scene in Connecticut, and in the New Haven area, it was Bill Miller's Sherry Shack. It was the Trapezoid, which was in Northford, Connecticut. It was something called uh, there was one called the Muse. Um, there was one called uh, well the Shack in Waterbury. Um, as opposed to the Sherry Shack. Shack and Waterbury the, um, was just like a big wooden thing, you know. And um, What was the scene? Was it a true teen place? Yes. Like, and there was these were just all, soda pop? Or yes, what was, what yes was it these like? were all teen places where there was no booze. So the only, and then the next echelon was the House of Zodiac. The House of Zodiac was on Derby Avenue in New Haven, Route 34, and that was an over-21 club. Remember now, this is before the the age dropped to 18 and briefly in Connecticut for only a few years. So we weren't anywhere near 21. So yeah, they were charging you a dollar for a Coke, which at the time was ridiculously expensive. And, you know, actually they were probably making more money than if they were selling booze. So they were all, um, they were all teen clubs. Also at the Trapezoid, I became a go-go dancer as well. So my parents, somehow I got over there because I couldn't drive. Um, we had these little mini dresses and we would get up and we would frug on either side of the band. That's where we sort of where we met the Wild Weeds. Um, and, was the Trapezoid literally a trapezoid? No, <laughs> no. But they all had names like that. The maze, the, you know, the... Um, they all have weird names like that, you know, trying to be psychedelic, I think, you know. And was there like a, a cadre of psychedelic bands, like young Not local? Maybe, no? but we, see, we were always more bluesy and right. kind of, but uh, the, and the North Atlantic Invasion Force, NAIF, they were around, uh, the Chosen Few, um, the Bram Riggs set, um, and the Shags, Doc Cavalier's bands, and then, of course, the Wild Weeds. The Wild Weeds were the undisputed king of the scene, very R&B oriented and extremely eclectic, but very no holds barred. You know, we're going to play Ray Charles. We're going to play the Soul Sisters. We're going to play, you know, we don't really give, you know, give a shit about, you know, after a while they put a Beatles song into the set. And I remember when they did, it was like a Beatles song, you know, that's very unusual for them. But the Wild Weeds were, well, of course, they had four hits, you know, so they, they had radio hits. So that started with No Good to Cry, so that was why. And then we began opening for the Wild Weeds. Well, and they were from kind of the Hartford, Windsor, Windsor Lock scene. Windsor. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that had to be kind of a, like, wow, something's going on there, right? Well, something was going on, and I know you've interviewed Al Anderson for yeah. this for this uh, series, what was going on was the Hartford Jazz Society. Exactly. And those cats were really, and Al Leepak, and those cats were really more into that. They were older, you know, and they were really more into that. So that's why they gravitated towards playing R&B. They had a great B3 player, Ray Ziner. And um, they just, you know, the whole Hartford scene, I thought, always was just more, at that point, was more of a jazz scene. New Haven was the place that had the rock and roll scene without question mm -hmm. so yeah that's and the teen clubs and and also we played um teen centers our first gig was the cheshire youth center uh teen centers cyo dances there's no booze so you know you had those were the kind of places you played it's just amazing to me that there was that level of teenage interest oh, in this cute. kind of music to um, well because it, you know at the time everything was exploding you know you know, with the Beatles and the Stones were at the top of the heap, but, you know, pretty soon, it, pretty soon it was Led Zeppelin. And, you know, by the time we st really started playing, Led Zeppelin was b bubbling under. You know, they were just kind of starting. We were huge Yardbirds fans. And, norm you know, there were so many different... And radio was so um, um, universal then. So much different stuff was being played on the radio that you could really hear so many different genres... And that's and a lot of bands just played every you know you, you almost played every genre, mm -hmm. and that was why kind of when we not to get ahead of myself but when we transitioned into a band called Fancy and then we transitioned into a band called the Scratch Band the Scratch Band was enormously eclectic. 
and I'm sure we'll get to that. Oh, we so, will. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you name the members of Wrong Black Bag? Yeah. Um, my brother, Vic Steffens, was on drums. Al Renato, who, who's out in Vegas now, he was on uh, B3 and, uh, and Farfisa organ. Uh, Tommy Maccarello, who lives in Florida now, great guitar player. Ellsworth Apgar, the late Ellsworth Apgar, was our bass player. Ellsworth was really, really, really an interesting, different kind of cat. Um, great bassist. He died a couple years ago. And and yours truly, the baby beehive queen, <laughs> lead vocal, and tambourine. We've seen the pictures. Yes, you've um, seen the pictures, folks, yeah. Did you just make that one record? Yeah, because then we were supposed to make an album, and you know the whole the whole record label basically imploded. Like that's what happened back in those days. Did you guys think you were gonna maybe strike it rich yes. with this album? Yeah, yeah, because especially when we saw ourselves on the charts, we didn't know that he bought us onto the charts. But Shad was a mover and groover. He might have been mopped up for all I know. Yeah. You know, oh. might have been mobbed up. Then what's after Wrong Black Bag? Uh, from the Wrong Black Bag, we go into a band called Fancy which was basically we had started working at Synchron in Wallingford, which then became Trod Nossel. And several of us uh, stayed in Fancy, my, me, my brother, and Al Renato. We added a guitar player named Doug Schlink, who is still around. Doug plays uh, mostly piano. He's an amazing musician. Um, and a bass player named Paula Sola, who had gone to Cheshire Academy with my brother, and then um, from New Britain, a really great singer, harmonica player named Bob Orsi, and that was Fancy. And we made, a, we made an album uh, called Fancy Meeting You Here, of course, what else would we call it, you know, with a very psychedelic cover, and um, it was supposed to look like a spaceship, but what it really was was a, a, a close-up of a light bulb, a turned-off light bulb, so they thought it was very trippy. And that goes on for a while, and then, it goes on for a couple of years, and then it morphs into this thing called the Scratch Band, right. which was a beginning. In the beginning, had Ray Ziner from the Wild Weeds on on uh, keyboards, and Billy Durso, who was an unbelievably eclectic guitar player from the Hartford scene. Billy on guitar, and then my brother uh, Doug Schlink, um, and Paul Asola and Bob Orsi, and then uh, Ziner and and uh, and Durso left. And you had the, the basic unit, and then Doug Schlink left, and a guy named G.E. Smith showed up to audition for guitar, and we took him. And then my brother decided to leave to form his own band, and a guy named Mickey Curry showed up. My brother recommended Mickey Curry. And that's the basic, you know, scratch band that most people know. Mm -hmm. um, and but was Fancy like a, a pure psychedelic band? What, no. What was the mission statement of Fancy? No, Fancy was, again... <laughs> My brother wrote, my brother and Bob Orsi wrote the songs. I didn't write songs then. And so it was an original. It was an original album. I think maybe we did, uh, we did a cover of a song called Black Snake Moan, which was like a Spider John Kerner or somebody like that. So again, there was that blues influence a little bit for Unfancy. Um, it, no, it wasn't psychedelic. Uh, it was just rock and roll of the time, you know, which, which, by the way, did have some elements of being psychedelic. You know, well, it sounds like the cover was probably yeah. psychedelic. <laughs> this cover was. They tried to make the cover yeah. psychedelic. I don't know really how successful it was, but yeah. So the Scratch Band and the Scratch Band becomes quite a force of nature in the area. You know, we play everywhere and we're seen, we're seen and be seen. And it, I have to say, it was a great. The level of musicianship was unbelievable, and and you know, and we knew that. So. Mm -hmm. um, we not to be snotty about it, but you know we were better. We were really the best band that was around for, and so um, it did. That's just the way it worked out. And well, we, but we had before a huge that, following. you have yeah. a uh, run in with Andrew Lou Goldham, right? So that's right around that time. Andrew Oldham shows up. The Scratch Band was already together. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, he shows up and in, in Wallingford, and he'd moved to early Connecticut. Early seventies. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it would have okay. been early. When or late scratch? 60s, maybe. No, not late 60s. It okay. was later than that. And he, um, he'd he moved to Wilton, Connecticut, and settled. And he had a deal with Rare Earth Records, which was an arm of Motown. Now, if you don't know who Andrew Oldham is, he's produced the Rolling Stones forever. And his famous liner notes and his wonderful productions of everything from Satisfaction to Have You Seen Your Mother Baby Standing in the Shadows and uh, get off my cloud, Ruby Tuesday. Those are all Andrew. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 
and he started hanging out and um, coming around. And among the things that we worked on was this thing, Metamorphosis, which is a, he had access to a lot of Rolling Stones masters, and we basically screwed around with them, to be quite honest. And I never thought much of it, but it's just been re-released. When I was here with you at the library a few months ago, Terry Landy, who's the mastering engineer at ABCO, brought me a new mastered vinyl version of Metamorphosis. Also, uh, there's a Rolling Stones track on there called Out of Time, which originally appeared on uh, Flowers, maybe, or... But my my voice is all over it. We What we did was we overdubbed onto those tracks. We overdubbed piano, vocals, you know, you name it. And it got used in Quentin Tarantino's film Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So they used that version. And Andrew, someone told Andrew that Tarantino was a huge fan of Metamorphosis. So I never knew that that was a later comp with overdubs yeah. and all that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It, the, the original version of Out of Time is... Um, yeah, it's on Flowers, I think. Flowers, yeah. yeah. So without 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 backup vocals, right. but then that was the one with the vocals was the one they chose to use in the movie. So that was kind of a great moment. And yeah, Andrew was around. He was around for for years. He and my husband were um, uh, business partners, and he lives in Colombia now with his wife, and uh, who's a Colombian TV star. Yeah. Was Trotten also just ground zero? Like if you wanted yeah. to get something going in yeah. rock and roll, that's where that was the magnet, huh? I would say so. I mean, at one point, there, we had, there was a record label there at one point. There, uh, it, was, it was definitely the hang. I mean, we just go there and hang, you know, forever. Uh, at one point, there, was, there were probably five or six bands working out of there at once, you know. Um, the B. Willie Smith Band, the Nelson Adlard Band, just different, different different bands. I mean, before that, Doc had had um, the Shags and the Bram Rig set, you know, pretty much. And um, they were they 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 were around the same time as the Wrong Black Bag. So that there had been quite a by this time, there had been a few years that it had gone by. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to say fancy. I want to say the fancy album came out in 68, maybe. And then. Um, so, yeah, the scratch band would have been maybe 70 started, maybe 70 two mm -hmm. or something like that yeah and andrew maybe mid 70s i'm not exactly sure it gets a little fuzzy yeah, of course what yeah. was doc like very unusual man very uh very dynamic uh very goal oriented knew what he wanted you know um he was originally an oral surgeon. That's where he got the name Doc, and he left his practice and sold it to somebody and just whole hog jumped into the music business. And so um, he really was a mentor to all of us and really put his money where his mouth was. I mean, spent a lot of money on, on different things for different people, all, you know, all in the, in the, in the service of promoting you know, the artistic uh environment i guess and and you know so he's really he was really kind of a throwback i think in that there were a you know there were people in chicago the chess brothers there were a lot of people that were starting record labels or had started record labels and were running independent labels he that's really what he wanted to do you know so when andrew came on the scene of course andrew was um had obviously cachet you know and uh, we, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun doing a lot of different things uh, there at that studio. Um, I don't know why I'm thinking of this now, but I interviewed yeah. um, Mike Watt from the Minutemen once, and sure. he said we believed in two things, gigs and flyers. Yeah. And, and we, we thought um, records were flyers, right? They're promoting yeah. the gig. Yeah. It was, for them, it was all about the gig. Was it yeah. about the gigs and the records or just the gigs. I mean, scratch band played around a lot. 28, 28, 29 days a month. Uh, again, at these under, most of these under 21, you know, they, we, we weren't playing in bars, you know, so to speak. Although after a while, I would have to say we started to, especially when the drinking age dropped, you know, but, um, but yeah, um, flyers, we, flyers were huge. We had all kinds of flyers. We had, 
a doc. We did a magazine. It was like mimeographed. I mean, hysterical. What was the magazine called? Well, I just think it was called TNA or something. It's T- Trodnozzle Artists, and had there was like a logo, and each each page was one of the bands, and then it would have your your gigs for the month. Somehow they they put they compiled them and stapled them, and you know it was. And I guess we gave them out at gigs. It was, but yeah, because back in the day, paper was everything. Everything was Xeroxed or mimeographed or, but there was no internet. So it was just, it was, everything was on paper. Yeah. Flyers. Good, good answer from him. I would have to say. Yeah. (laughs) But did you see records as that, as that, that's a promotional material or did you, or was that a a means to an end? Like you wanted, you really wanted to make a record. Oh no, we really wanted, we wanted to be played on the radio and we were played on the radio, but I mean, and, and you know what? I have to say, we did not merch the way we merch now. We didn't bring records on the gigs and try to sell them. Their deal was get the records into record stores. You know, we wanted to, we were going to be in, you know, Tower Records. We were going to be wherever. And that's where the records were going to be sold. We did not bring them around and sell them on gigs. And I don't know anybody that did, actually, in Connecticut. I mean, maybe they did, but, you know, we didn't do that. Because for one thing, they break and they, they melt and, you know, everything else, so. And would you guys play all over the Northeast, I'm yeah, assuming? Yeah. And, you know, we traveled quite a bit. Um, and it was, it, was, it was grueling. I mean, we played a lot every month. Would you drive yeah. back home certain distances? Sometimes or we would stay over. Yeah, it did, would depend. We, sometimes we routed where we stayed over. Like we, you know, I remember we, <laughs> I was just talking to somebody about this. With the Oak Beach Inns on Long Island, the OBI, you would play them. And I'm sure anybody you talk to about this time period will tell you the gigs were grueling. Like there were three, four sets a night. It was ridiculous. Starting from when to when? Um, eight to midnight, seven to midnight, you know. Um, it's like the Beatles and Hamburg. One, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the OBIs had, um, the, the main one was a big, it almost looks like The Shining. It was a big old hotel. We ended up there once, and wherever you played, you would converge on the oh, the big one, and each band would get like a, a wing, you know. So it's the middle of the winter. There's no freaking heat in the place. We're running around the hall screaming. There's other bands in there, which we don't know, you know. I mean, the whole thing was wild. You could never do it now. I mean, it was, it was just like, yeah, okay, you guys can have the OBI, and you can just go there and stay there. There was nobody watching us. You know, I mean, we could completely trash the place, you know, but it was freezing. I mean, I just, just, and yeah, we're not, and by the way, we're not going to turn the heat on, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but that was rock and roll. That was, that was what we did. You laugh about it now. I mean, yeah. it's probably great now looking back it on it. It wasn't very funny at the time. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. It was probably a struggle at the it time. It was. It was a struggle, but we also had a lot of fun. I mean, it was a great band. And so we played our asses off every night and m- many, many memorable shows. And uh, we had a 300 song set list, you know, song list. We played everything, everything, because every, each of us had a different sort of area of expertise. One cat knew a lot about Delta Blues. I knew a lot about girl groups and, uh, you know, Dusty Springfield and things like that. And then uh, when G.E. Smith came into the band, he introduced us to Little Feet. We didn't even know who Little Feet were. He did. And then we became Little Feet aficionados, you know, so it all kind of just mashed up together. We might play a, a Crystal song and then Ring of Fire by Johnny Cash and then something by Little Feet. And then we did a bitchin' version of Hollywood Swingin' by Case by um, a Cool and the Gang, you know, with, we had no horn players, but we had this great harmonica player, Bob Orsi. So anyway, it was a lot of fun. Great fun. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's, how did how was the SNL connection made? I assume you did some kind of gig with well, Warren G- Michaels adjacent or something yeah, like yeah. that. So yeah, so GE of course was was in the Scratch Band. He then leaves. He marries Gilda Radner three years, and then after that, he ends up when Lauren Michaels comes back after being away for a few years, he becomes the band leader with uh, T Bone Wolk on bass and. Pretty much the same, a lot of the same people that had been there right from the beginning, but GE comes in. And after a certain point in time, it gets to be the early 90s, and one day, and I, and I, we keep in touch, because GE and I um, 
are both collectors and we always talk about the older the better we you know we just saw each other a couple months ago it was his birthday and I stayed over at the house and all we talked about was the older I just found something from 1927 you know that kind of thing one day my phone rings and it's him and he wants to know if I'm free I have a gig and I, I need to get a I need to get a singer he doesn't say what the band is it's out of the blue and I said sure and he said well you know those those great mixtapes you've been sending me because uh, I used to make mixtapes out of my vinyl collection of deep southern soul and uh I'm going to get some charts written from still does not divulge that it's the Saturday Night Live band okay great you know we talk about eight or nine songs or ten or whatever and then as as it moves ahead a little it transpires that the band will be the current version of the Saturday Night Live band and we're going to do a gig at the Stephen Talk House in Amagansett and that's great and then there'll be a gig the following day and they still don't tell me the gig the following day turns out to be Lorne Michaels wedding reception at his estate in the Hamptons and so there we are they set us up on a stage and you know Nicholson is around the property and John Goodman and everybody's there and we get up and we do what year is this around uh, 90 91 okay yeah. so and we'd already had some great rehearsals we'd had a couple of days of great rehearsals so I knew the cats the night before we had played the talk house we get up we do we run through our numbers you know I remember we played two sets, and then people still wanted to dance, and we didn't know any more songs. So we played the first set over again, basically. It was hysterical. So then I went back to the hotel, and I thought, well, that's that was a lot of fun, but that's that, you know. Um, the next week was the opening of the season in September at Studio 8H, and Lauren Michaels comes across the, <laughs> across the studio and looks around the stage our our band stage and says to GE where's the girl and G what do you mean where's the where's the girl that was with you at the wedding he said well I just thought you wanted me to get a vocalist for no 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 she was great call her up and tell her to come next week and I'm still there so that's how I got it I said I got it from a wedding gig you know but it was a high class wedding gig and for sure and uh we still to this day play those songs we still play those 10 songs or if, now it's more like 15 or 20 but we still play them so you know it just goes to show that um you need to be prepared for anything you need to throw down wherever you are and then maybe somebody will walk across a studio in nbc and say where's the girl beautifully put thank you yeah thank you um my goodness. And I mean, yeah, I mean, that that has to be such a great sustenance for you to yeah. have that as a regular, you yeah. know, gig. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, First of all, it's an amazing band. Yeah. And amazing group of people in general there. Been a very strange last two years. I will admit that, you know, a lot of a lot of virtual singing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But um but, you know, it really is a family, and um, I say to people, you know, it's said that Mike Myers fashioned Dr. Evil after Lauren. That really is not the case. He's really, he's really the head of the family. There's no question about it. And so it's been one of the joys of my life to work there, truly. What are some of, some of your favorite memories? Um, my absolute favorite memory was the first time we had Paul McCartney on. And since then, he sort of comes and hangs around every once in a while. But he came, and um, they have a sound check at around 5 o'clock for the guest band. And then the dress rehearsal is at 7.30. And at 5 o'clock, that's when we break and we go have dinner. And they give the guest band one more time to go through their songs. But instead, he decided to do a little mini set. And everybody was so taken with it. Lauren came out. We were all standing there played extra songs that he wasn't going to play and one of them was Lady Madonna and then he started playing Hey Jude and the late Chris Farley was standing next to me and said would you dance with me and we sort of waltzed around the studio while he played Hey Jude and I, that's my undisputed number one best um, watching Nirvana trash the stage after their first appearance but a la The Who you know 
And you just knew that you'd seen something that you'd never seen before. It was so unique and different, you know. But I was also there <laughs> for the ripping up the Pope picture, Sinead O'Connor. I was there for that, standing almost right in front of her when she did it. And then um, that girl, Simpson, Ashley Simpson, when she screwed up her set and went running off, I was there for that too. So those are two, you know, weird moments. But I can remember... Um, one Christmas, we had Luciano Pavarotti with Vanessa Williams to do Adeste Fideles with an orchestra as the musical guest. And it was off the chart, you know, so a lot of um, goosebump-inducing moments. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah really. Um, and then at some point, Rebel Montez. Mm -hmm. Rebel Montez comes up after the scratch band has broken up. First, I had a band called... Christine Oman, the Soul Rockers, for a couple of years. And we really, then I really went the whole hog towards just playing, you know, soul music. I Can't Turn You Loose, my Otis Redding, you know, it's a lot of different stuff like that. Um, but I'd begun writing. So uh, finally, I never had written before, and began writing. And so I began really getting a, a bunch of originals together. And after the Soul Rockers broke up, I decided I, I should I needed to have a band you know of my own and I really needed to put my toe in the water big time, and so I took the leap and uh, and I was lucky you know I, I got I got great guys right away. Uh, Michael Colbath on bass is still with me to this day and uh, and we started making records. I started making solo records and my first uh, solo record came out in '92, so. Um, the hard way and and that was you know I never really envisioned doing that I always thought I would be a band member you know but things transpire and you know you have to evolve and you have to change and so um, it wouldn't have been actually my choice but I've been happy I've been happy in the role of band leader and I uh, think I'm pretty good at it and I know I'm a, I know I'm pretty good at writing I turned out to be I think the best writer but you know it just took me a long time to come around to it what inspires you to write? Is it needing the material for a live show, or is it just I living write, life and yeah, life basically, or reading something or seeing something? I write a lot of I write titles and a lot of the big joke is I write stuff on napkins. You know, I know I read a thing with John Hyatt where he said he has a shoebox full of little pieces of paper, and really, I I have a lot of little pieces of paper. I keep them all in one place, or try to keep them all in one place, and that sometimes just helps you, you know, I spend a lot of time on my lyrics, so sometimes it just helps you piece things together, you know. Um, I had a, a I'd, I'd cut an article out of the New Yorker years ago. I keep like a notebooks, and uh, it was about um, firefighting in Louisiana, uh, out in the country, and I started thinking about what if a sugar cane field caught on fire? Uh, you know, it would be it would be like car caramel, the caramel smell, you know, and everything else. And then I started extrapolating that to um, the end of a love affair, and I called the song "Burning Sugar." And it real it's one of it's real it's the brand newest one. And uh, but that came out of something that literally I'd had I'd been looking at that article. There's something in this article. I know there is. You know. Um, and that's where the idea came from. You know, you never, you never really know, mm -hmm. never know. Um, you've done a ton of different tribute shows, yeah. duets to yeah. talk about some of the oh, God. highlights. If you, if you, no, will. you know, I was thinking earlier when I was coming in that, uh, well, Doc died 17 years ago, and at that point, I just decided I was going to network, and I was going to open myself and start traveling, and... You were married to Doc, yes? Well, we were never legally married, but okay. we were together for a long, long, long time, and in Connecticut, there's no common law, so, you mm -hmm. know, we... <laughs> more's the pity, but, you know, but yeah, we were together for a really long time, and... uh I just decided I was, you know, this was going to be, I had a short list of people that I knew I could trust in the business and I reached out to them. I started really opening myself up and it just spectacularly uh, succeeded. I mean, I, I couldn't have asked for better. 
Um, I had already done a Grammy-nominated album with Charlie Musselwhite earlier, but then I began uh, working with Ian Hunter. I began working with Dion. I began working with Marshall Crenshaw, uh, LaVon Helm. Um, I began uh, Ronnie Spector. You know, Ronnie Spector became a friend of mine, a uh, dear friend. And uh, I just really began opening myself to sort of any possibility. I traveled down south. I took a, 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 I traveled through the Delta Charlie Musselwhite was my blogging partner, telling me where to go, you know. Um, I started going to, uh, after a while, to Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Um, I established um, uh, good, very, very good contacts in Nashville, very good contacts in New Orleans. I'm on the board of the New Orleans, uh, one of the national spokespeople for the New Orleans Musicians Clinic. Then I began working with Mac Revenac this ju- and, the, and the reducers. It just all sort of just kept kind of uh, blossoming, you know. Uh, the Americana Festival in Nashville with uh, and Bonnie Bramlett. Uh, uh, we do a gospel show there, and we'll, we'll be bringing it back this September to Nashville with all female singers called Sunday School. And um, was it scary or uh, was very, this like okay? Very. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't know jack shit. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about publishing. I didn't know anything. I, I had to get my publishing back, which I did. Um, I did, just didn't know anything about anything. But I made a short list of people that I knew I could trust, and God love them. They all helped me, you know. Um, Kenneth Higney and Jimmy Levitt at, at, uh, in Marshall Chess's office at Arc Music. They helped me immeasurably. Um, uh, just different people. Um, and so... And, and, and then from then on, I began to really establish myself as somebody that could be trusted, somebody that if you, if, you, if you worked with me, you know I would come ready, I would throw down. And as I always say, you know, your reputation precedes you. In this business, you can only screw up a minimal number of times, you know, before someone else will step into the shoes, you know. So it really boils down to how much do you value your yourself how much do you value your career how your ethics your 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 personal sense of responsibility to the gig is just go back to what you said Brendan about the gig it's really all about the gig it's all about the audience you know audience is everything so to be super prepared to be you know uh, I mean, SNL is a great proving ground for that. There isn't even a seven-second delay. There is nothing. No safety net. Lauren doesn't want it. He says it takes away the edge. So if you're going to screw up, you're going to screw up in front of everybody. So, you know, you better not. You better exactly know where are you supposed to be in the studio, at what time, when, you know, how how are you going to get there through all the wires and all the, can- you know, and then uh, you just better be ready. In this day and age, it'd be so easy to, um, the forces seem against us, right? So, but I got to say, just in the little time that we've worked together, um, you will not consider that alternative. No, (laughs) no, because, you know, to, to, I'm like, it's, it's like, you know, when you study a cat like James Brown. You know, or 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 Ronnie. The, the thing about Ronnie Spector, for instance, is Ronnie Spector used to say, uh, when she'd go do the shows at the Brooklyn Fox with Marie the K, how can some of these singers they show up with curlers in their hair? How can that be? She every time she went out, she had to be completely ready to go. You know, and so you know, I do. I tease my hair up a lot. You know, I use a lot of hairspray, and uh, and it's you have to be you have to be ready, but also, the, it's it's the respect. It's the respect for the gig. It's a, somebody like Duke Ellington or, or James Brown or Dusty Springfield, as, as, as terribly beset with stage fright as she was, nevertheless impeccable every time she showed up. And that's kind of what you have to do. And if you're a band leader, there's just that much more baggage to it because that, there's that much more stuff you have to do, you know. But I'm, if, if I'm going to take something, I'm not going to be half-assed, you know. That that nothing pisses me off more than that, and I've seen it, and it's like, what the hell are you? Do- Why are you here? <laughs> Why are you even here? You don't you don't really intend to do this. You don't even have the proper respect for the gig, mm-hmm. you know. So in that respect, I guess I'm really a throwback. But um, 
That's the only way I know how to do it. Um, you call yourself a collector. Yeah. Talk to us about that. Like, it must inspire you. You must just dig deeper. You must... Yeah, well, the fact that I ended up um, spending so much time in Muscle Shoals is just really in, insanely full circle because I, I, I realized early on, I went to a tag sale near my house in Connecticut and there were four shoe boxes of 45s and I bought them for $5 each and I brought them home and they were a perfect little collection of what you call deep Southern soul. So they were records made in Memphis, records made in Muscle Shoals, records made in, in uh, well, Nashville actually had a pretty decent soul scene, but all Southern stuff. And that was sort of the nucleus of, I already had a lot of 45s, but then I began building off of that. When I would go to the Jazz and Heritage Festival with my, with my father in, in New Orleans, we used to go to Record Ron's, which was this great store. The guy was from Brooklyn on Decatur Street. And he just, you know, I would go in there with what you call your want list. Uh, people that collect records, it's called a want list. And I would go in there with that. But then once the internet opened up, I just began... But before that, you know, I was a note taker. I had notebooks, freaking notebooks of this stuff, you know. Um, you know, what's the deal about Sunny Land Slim? What's the deal about Sun House? How is he connected to Robert Johnson? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, uh, who was the original lead singer in the Chantels? That was all written down. Now you can find it at, you know, the, in two seconds. But also... I go around and I do, sometimes I do uh, workshops on, on, on history. And YouTube, you can, you can find anything on YouTube now. What they call a static YouTube, which is a picture of a record label, and then the song starts playing. You don't need a want list. There it is, you know? And so that just opened up my world entirely. And, and you know, and when you meet people, there's, there are people in every scene like Dave Malone in The Radiators in, in, uh, and Reggie Scanlon in The Radiators in New Orleans. I can talk to them about anything. I, I almost can't stump them, you know. Um, when GE was on tour with Dylan all those years, I used to send him tapes all the time. He would play them on the bus, and he said, I couldn't, I couldn't stump Bob with those tapes. I'd put the tape in, and he'd go, oh, yeah. That's little brother Montgomery. Yeah, you know, he goes back and he would start talking about every single track, you know. But that's what happens. After a while, your mind becomes encyclopedic. And, you know, everything connects to everything else in some arcane way. You know, it's, it's, it's wild. It's really wild. But in, but in fact, the Internet is, um, that's really what the Internet is, you know. So... Back in the day, we had to do it all in our head, but mm. I think I did a pretty good job of it. But yeah, mostly, I don't collect magazines. I mean, I mostly collect records, and I see where you were going with that. Yeah, I don't collect magazines, or although I do have a pretty good book collection of music books, you know. Um, but yeah, and so, uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty wild. The yeah. thing is pretty wild. Um. <laughs> I, I hate I even have to pose this as a question, yeah. but um Go ahead. You're, you're a woman in rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say that I think it's gotten a whole lot better, but it has not. Um I just love these articles about wow, the women of Nashville. They're so you know, as a matter of fact, let's face it, you know, there are X number of them and yes, are they doing pretty well? Yes. Are they doing as well as Kenny Chesney? No. You know, they are not. And um, and so, you know, the vast majority of what goes on in Nashville now are songs about beer and pickup trucks. And although there are some stunningly great women that are working, uh, you know, there always have been stunningly great women. And let's face it, you know, uh, Tammy Wynette, uh, Loretta Lynn. So in general, I think that it maybe is inching up where it's better. Um but I, but honestly, I would have thought by this time that it would have been ahead of where it is now. I don't know what you think, but I now as now as a band leader, you know, really all my all my best friends are men. I mean, I've I've had to I've been working in a male dominated industry for so long. 
that they're all, all my best friends are men. And, and that's, that's how I relate, you know, but, but still I, I love to reach out. Uh, I'm on the board of the uh, Institute for the Musical Arts with June Millington in, up in north of Northampton, the Rock and Roll Camp for Girls. I'm on the board of that along with Ani DeFranco and Bonnie Raitt. And we are totally into girls playing, you know, and writing and becoming engineers. They, have, they actually have a whole section now in the summer where they teach girls how to be engineers. And uh, somebody like Terry Landy, as we mentioned before, is a great uh, example of a woman that has gone far in the technical area, you know. But um, it's still a boy's game, and you really, you have to really, you have to really believe it's because it is, you know. But still, I think. Also, one of the things I tell the girls that I mentor and the girls that I talk to is just know, and this is, this is the truth, is that you're going to have to be better. You're going to have to be twice as good in order to be on a par with the men. See, if you're just what you are, they expect you to be less than them. So you just have to be better and more together and more. And, and I'm always harping on this with them and more together and more uh, centered and please don't act stupid and, you know, don't start going out with the guitar player and then break up the whole band because of it, you know, because this is just the way of the world. And then, you know, and then it'll be, oh, well, she broke up the band, you know, that kind of thing. It's so stupid. But, but before a lot of those Brits came in, I mean, women used to roll rock and roll. I mean, they, I think oh, they the do today, groups. but yeah. well, girl groups or even something like yeah. Irma Thomas or... Well, Harris or well, they had not well. First of all, they weren't really rock and roll, so they I don't think. But they but remember though, Brendan, those women were all under the thumb of male producers completely. So, and although Irma, the one of the one that you mentioned there, the one that sort of because Irma had such a lovely relationship with Alan Toussaint, you know. And it was, she really is truly the soul queen of New Orleans. But as we know, you know, the Ronettes, the terrible uh, a problem with Phil Spector, Tina Turner, the terrible problem with Ike Turner. Um, and, and in general, just under the thumb of a bunch of men. Although, yes, they were the visible face of radio. You do raise a good point. They ruled the radio airwaves, you know. But as it turns out, they didn't rule the business end of it. That's right. And uh, but no, you're right. You're right. And um, and yeah, and there was kind of a turnaround. And the turnaround, I think, started with the Beatles and the Stones mm -hmm. being all men. You had, you know, Dusty Springfield being a, an example of a woman that skyrocketed in that world. But um, the next thing you know, you had all of these self-contained groups that were writing their own music, the birds, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And pretty much all men. And that, so yeah, so you do raise a good point as far as how the balance shifted on radio. Mm -hmm. um, that's true. Yeah. Mm. The girl group sound was an insanely great thing, I will say. Yeah, and I think at least historically we're shifting away from, oh, the producer is so great, and now on to the right. artist. Yeah. who made that happen yeah, is exactly. great. <laughs> I, I, I do think, I do think, and that's part of what the way the media also helps portray that, you know, although there are, you know, obviously several, I mean, Dave Cobb in, in Nashville, and there are several sort of uber rock star producer kind of guys, you know, that, and mostly all guys, you know, but, but still, um, I'm very heartened by, there's so many great, you know, female writers and, and singers, and, it does provide a different outlet, I think, uh, to, to the male um, viewpoint. And we need it when we need both. We definitely need both mm. without question. Um, it could be today or yesterday. And you can mm -hmm. think about this, but who in Connecticut inspires you? Right now? Yeah. Or musically or otherwise, you know. Well, you know, I'm sort of I'm sort of removed from the Connecticut scene now a little bit because I go so far afield. But I, you know, Al Anderson has always been a beacon for me. Uh, he has been my musical big brother almost uh, from from my teen years, 
early teen years. And um, it's a great full circle moment now for me to be out performing with him. Um, and but um, I kind of I don't know really. Um, I mean, besides Al, I would say that um, I, I don't I, I I don't really know. Well, that's fine. Do you have yeah. mentors now, or people you Ow. look up to? Ow. <laughs> no, Ow. no. Well, no, not really. We're, we're pretty equal now, but not not really. No. Um, I I mean, I have people whose opinions I respect greatly, you know. And uh, no, nobody's really nobody's really my my mentor. I don't think. But I have people that I go to for to ask for advice and what do you think about this, you know, kind of thing. Sean Pelton, the drummer for the SNL band, is somebody that I greatly love and greatly respect. Andy York. Andy York has worked on all of my albums with me. He's with John Mellencamp now for 25 or more years. Andy's played on every record. He produced The Deep End. Uh, my brother Vic, my brother Vic at Horizon in West Haven, you know, Vic is a great bulwark in the scene for not only for younger artists, but, you know, he's always helping somebody is also very connected to the gospel scene in Bridgeport and which is a great a great bunch of talented people so but I don't know that I actually have a mentor right now no I think I've I've passed to be I am the mentor <laughs> you know it's that kind of thing <laughs> it's like yeah <laughs> what is that what was that yeah um I am Iron Man no I am mentor yeah <laughs> good question though yeah it's a good question um what do you got going on the rest of the year? Oh God! Yeah, where do I start? Uh, well, one of the interesting things you and I were just talking about this at dinner is this guy Don Randy, who's coming from the West Coast. He's a member of the Wrecking Crew. I th- we think there, are, you and I think there are only two surviving members of the Wrecking Crew. Him, he's a piano player, and Carol Kay, the bass player. I'm doing three gigs with him at the end of June. I'm um, doing gigs with Al Anderson in the middle of June, including the Shabu. Uh, Reunion in Willimantic. Al's going to be appearing at that. Um, I'll be at the WC Handy Festival in Muscle Shoals in July. In September, I'll be at the AMA in Nashville doing Sunday School. Uh, Rebel Montez has a full docket of uh, festival appearances, including our version of Sunday School, which will be at Rhythm and Roots uh, over Labor Day weekend. Um, moving into the fall, um, I'll be doing some chair. I have a charity show in Baltimore. I'll be doing um, in October. Um, God, one of the best things I did this year, and you were there, was I was asked by the family to be the MC of the Celebration of Life for Ronnie Spector at the beginning of May. For uh, for those of you who are listening to this archived, it's June of 2022 now, and uh, and that was such an honor and unexpected completely um, I tried to do my best for her memory it was a great night very joyful in the end and uh, and I'm hoping um, that everybody but that was there was 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 touched and moved and you know went out of there feeling edified you know that was kind of my that was kind of my um, my my goal so yeah, and then SNL will go back, come back in early October, and uh, it you know, uh, and then it just kind of rolls on. I mean, I find oh, so yeah. Besides Metamorphosis being re-released, uh, Terry Landy tells me that there is a Rolling Stones seven-inch vinyl single, and I'm on some of those. She told me, and I'm going to be getting a, a complimentary. That I'm excited about that because that's now probably, I got to buy it. <laughs> that's probably like a couple hundred bucks, and I'm you know get, getting going to get a comp of that. Um, that was again. These are some of these things are unexpected. You know, you don't really expect them, and then they just kind of show up. So, yeah, it's you know coming out of this pandemic, and which hopefully we are, and uh, it's been a ridiculously weird two years in the music business. That's for sure. I'd like to see it be over. Yeah. Um, I know we keep saying that, you know, but I'd like to see it be over, Brendan. Could you picture um, life being any different? For me? Yeah. Um, I don't I don't think about retiring at all. Um, I'm sort of of the Keith Richard mentality or the Muddy Waters mentality, you know. It's just like because um, 
these opportunities keep coming to me. So that is always um, energizing. And, and, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a sense of great gratitude in my heart all the time for just that anybody who wants to listen to me at all. I'm like, wow, you want me to come over there and sing? I can't believe it. You know, that's, it's that kind of thing. I'm, I'm never endingly surprised by the way things have gone. And, uh, and I say that with all honesty, I'm just never endingly surprised. So no, I'm, I mean, I, I, I'd like to travel more. Um, I'm part of this thing called the sessions panel, which is, an interactive all-star um, live presentation. We, we go to music schools and we've gone all over the world. There really was a crimp put in that um, by the pandemic. I'm looking forward to that. Ho- hopefully to go overseas with them again would be great. You know, we always have a wonderful time. And um, so that, you know, something like that would be would be wonderful. But other than that, I just kind of, I just kind of get ready. I'm just ready for anything, you know, so pick pick up the phone, call me, email me, whatever. Let's see, let's see if we can do something, you know. And uh, Oh, yeah, we're making up, finally make another record. There's been a long time between my last record. So we really, 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 we want to get together and, and make a, we've been playing some, we've been playing some new songs and get together and do that. And that'll be fun. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else that I've forgotten? God, I don't know. I don't know. Thank you for having me. It's amazing. I'm, I, I'm yeah. really honored to be asked. You know, and uh, I uh, this whole this whole studio and the whole project, I think, and the Verso Fest and everything else is just a great thing. It's a great thing for Connecticut and the music scene. And I know you're involved some in the scene in New York too. And so it's you know, it's good for the Northeast. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Thank Thank you, Brandon. (laughs) (laughs) To close us out, here's Rock and Roll Love Letter by the Scratch Band, written by Connecticut's own Tim Moore.